I have you now. They want to mess with my droid. They're going to pay for it. This is the way. You may fire when ready. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! The way you're fighting, you wouldn't have lasted long. Hello there. You know me. This tape does not make you intelligent. So this is the first time in a in a while that I've felt a standalone episode of The Bad Batch. You know, one that didn't do a double premiere or one that wasn't the beginning when three episodes premiered. Moved the ball anywhere, and I still didn't feel like it did that pretty much at all. Um, I'm really getting... The visuals are so stunning, and they're great, and I love watching this show. I'm getting tired of talking about how stunning the visuals are and having to to the plot just not match the visuals sometimes. And so there were a lot of highlights in this episode for me. I want to make that clear. It was a show full of Ventress. I had expected her to come in at the last two minutes, and she was in the entire episode. Um, we got to see what we assume is Omega's foray into Jedi training. Um, and we got to see a really cool creature climax at the end of the episode. The problem is the same, though, that we as the audience know the answers. We know what an M count is. And so every episode the batch takes to find that out, um, the things that we as the audience know is one less episode we have left. And so, you know, the ending of this episode pretty much set up that we now we know what M count is, so we're going to need a new thing the Batch needs to do, which is probably escape the island. Um, and so this this episode, it, it may have had great moments, but again, I feel like it failed to take us forward with the plot. Um, and we've been in the same mystery since the premiere, and it's starting to feel feel hard to get through. Um, I hope we have some correction on the horizon, though, but we still have a lot to talk about in this episode, regardless of if it moved the plot forward for the series as a whole, because it moved a lot of things in the Star Wars universe. There's a few pieces of dialogue that are rife with debate that we can talk about, and there's other pieces of dialogue that are shoring up other parts of the Star Wars franchise. And so we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to get to. So here to get in the weeds with me is the prehistoric Pabuan parasite himself, Colin Archer. Hey, Carter. Once again, super glad to be here. Super looking forward to this one. I think there's some really titanic moments in this episode that have a lot of implications for this for the Star Wars franchise as a whole. Yeah, right? we don't we don't talk very much before these shows um, to save our conversation for this, but you did mention you liked this episode much better than I did. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty persuasive sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so, and again, I, I have to apologize. I was really hasty in watching this episode. Again, there's a lot going on personally, and just really had to cram this one in there. So I'm sure I'm kind of missing some of the details just a little bit. But, uh, you know, listening to it like I did, it there's some just seeing Ventress on the screen. I mean, it's really going to open up more questions than answers. You might have to spoil that book for me a little bit. Sure. Because sure. I don't know how she died or what the circumstances yeah, I are. Think we're going to have to talk time a lot. It, time it took place. And, and there's a remark she makes at the end. <laughs> and so there's it, there's all this stuff that ties in that have these titanic implications of as far as like talking about M count, all the off screen stuff, like uh, how they decided to do this with this character. Uh, what, how did they arrive at these conclusions that, and, and the biggest question, where'd she come from? You know, why are they putting her in this? And it's all, no, there's nothing. This is all speculation. This is why you listen to the star Wars station podcast to get your most informed uh, thoughts and discussion on this. And I, cause I've got my thoughts. Carter has his, he has more info. I haven't read that previous book. So yeah, I actually, none of my problems stem from that book. There's a, I mean, I want to talk about that at the end cause there is a little bit that is worth saying about that book, but there's not a lot that ties into dark disciple in this episode. Um, there's not a lot that ties into most of Ventress's past except for the, the batch's revelation halfway through the show. And so, I, I really, really liked the big moments that you're talking about, and I really want to talk about those because they have wider implications for the universe. Um, and anytime we can get down into the weeds. And there were some good parallels through shots and the way that characters behave that I really enjoyed. It just, again, it felt like the episode could have provided more um, when it when it didn't. And so, you know, we can kick it off. We can just begin talking about the episode. So it opens with Crosshair and Wrecker helping a Pabuan woman... Who, on her fishing boat, 
Um, they're getting her loaded up to go out and fish, and this is just the, the cold open for us to show us that, you know, the Batch is still a part of this Pabu community and that they're helping out. And, you know, it, it doesn't specifically mean some time has passed, and much time probably hasn't passed, but a little bit of time has passed, and it's just day-to-day life for the Batch on Pabu. Yep. They got to they gotta keep somehow, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and it's even still, there's there's this conversation on the dock between Wrecker, Hunter, and Crosshair, and it is just insane to me how good the show looks. I said in the beginning that I'm tired of talking about how good the show looks. I'm only tired of that because of the other elements, because the show is simply stunning. Just looking at the clone models speaking to each other, it looks gorgeous. And again, the backdrop of Pabu is just perfect. Yeah, it really is. Uh, I mean, uh, you can't say enough about this stuff, how cool it looks, especially compared to some of the first Clone Wars stuff. Right, right. Um, so we have Hunter and Crosshair discussing the fact that they haven't heard anything from Finnick, so they don't know about, you know, the, the intel that they're supposed to get. Um, and now knowing who shows up and the way it works, I would be interested to go back and hear the dialogue that Finnick told to the hologram at the end of last episode, because it would, it felt more hostile than this episode turned out to be. Yeah, it really did. I, I mean, and, and I, I was thinking that, uh, pondering this episode on the way over here it's like i really ought to watch these end scenes with finnick i mean because every character and as we find out later in this episode too knows more they're they're not tipping their hand they're playing their hand very close to their chest Mm -hmm. they know more than than what they are alluding to and so finnick had to have known what m count was that she automatically picks up picks up her speed dials like yes this person knows exactly mm-hmm. what that is. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, I mean, because, you know, that, that was the water cooler moment for the last episode was who is she talking to? We asked the question and she could have, uh, just blatantly sold out the batch, uh, and Omega. She could have, uh, said, Hey, let's team up and capture this bounty, uh, um, turn it over to the empire or, and, and, but instead she, she's, uh, um, on the on, on the good line side, and called her uh, M count friend. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We know that Finnick has a little bit of a heart to her. So, yep. She she communicated with Ventress, and that's where we end up at the beginning of this episode. Omega and Batcher are hanging out on the beach, just playing by this cavern. Um, and then they discover this awesome looking ship, really cool design, and we get a way better look at it at the end of the episode. Um, and they discover this really cool ship in the cavern and then boom, super anticlimactic Ventress reveal. It's like she's a, it's like she's a skeleton in a closet. It's just all (laughs) of a sudden the light shines on her and then boom, there she is right there. Ventress jump scare, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And this was, this was, uh, anticlimactic is almost underselling it, you know? Oh, there's my text tone. I wonder if anybody heard (laughs) it. These aren't the droids we're looking for. So it, uh. I was expecting like some fight and her to jump in, you know, I was thinking it was going to be a big deal when she showed up, but no, it's like she just appeared out of nowhere. Yes, she did. Exactly. And she's just boom. And then that was the other thing. I wasn't expecting her to show up. Um, I basically, I was wondering what this ship was. I kind of thought maybe it would be Ventress's, but for her to show up so early in the episode and for us to get a full episode of Ventress, now that was a big, awesome thing. I'm very happy we didn't spend a whole episode chasing some goose around and then at the very end we find Ventress. Yeah, yeah. We got to get a whole episode with the character and it was quite the adventure as far as I'm concerned. Well, and it also doesn't seem like her character will be a mainstay of the last few episodes. I bet she comes back. But it doesn't seem like she'll be back in every single yeah, one of yeah. the last she's, episodes. She's not joining the batch on their adventure. For exactly, sure. and so we're only going to get a few more, a few more glimpses of Ventress, I assume. Yep. Um, for now, for now, and so Finnick, we learn that Finnick is the one who sent Ventress, and so we know as the audience that Ventress is now a good guy, or at least is a neutrally aligned person, um, and she has no no warm feelings for the Empire, and so we know that this is a good thing. Um, the batch doesn't specifically know that. Um, 
But then Ventress, you know, she wants to, she says her payment is to know why they want this information. The batch refuses to give it to her. Um, but Omega, in a very not sneaky way, says what it is because she wants to know so badly. And Ventress says that asking about M count attracts the wrong kind of attention. And this is the first line of a lot of lines of this episode, um, where we're, where we as the audience are seeing the Bad Batch learn just how sinister the Empire can be. And by the end of this, these guys are going to be familiar because we we have to think about at this point in time, especially at this point in time, this is only a year after the Empire was founded, virtually nobody in the galaxy has any clue that the Empire is dark side aligned or anything. I mean, it, that isn't general knowledge at any point in galactic history that the Empire is even even during the time of the sequels, people just understand the Empire to be evil because it's a tyrannical government. They don't see it being ran by Sith Lords or running secret cloning experiments. Or quizzers or... bounce around everywhere. Exactly. And so this kind of attention, this is the first line we get where the Batch are about to learn what this kind of attention yeah, is. Yeah, it's almost like the Inquisitors are going to be in the next episode. You think so? Or soon enough. Yeah, I think you're right. I do think that we'll eventually have to get one. But it has to be, I mean, to me, it feels like it has to be the Grand Inquisitor because we don't so, know man. anything about cool? the program yet. I don't think we have, we have a lot of information on the Inquisitorious at this point. But, like, how many of them were there? We yeah, know that. Uh, uh, well, so your choices are Inquisitor or Darth Vader. Right. And Vader would add a lot of gravitas to this episode. But people who are watching The Bad Batch are familiar enough with Star Wars to not have to have Darth Vader in every property, right. I think. I right. mean, No, I agree. I, I think that would be a little bit heavy handed, like literally because Darth Vader shows up. <laughs> but um, <laughs> right, right. But <laughs> but the care like all you need. OK, so uh, the Bad Batch is cool. But they're going to get dunked by Darth Vader. Well, they got dunked by Asajj Ventress. It yeah, was a well, three I, versus yeah, one fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we're going to talk about that. I, I didn't want to allude to that yet. But if an Inquisitor shows up, they have a chance, right? As they always do, because Inquisitors are the whipping bag of yeah, rebels. Exactly. All this, yeah. Other they stuff. just, I mean, they're the, they're the foil. That's the yeah. reason the Inquisitor was even invented. Is because they said we have to have a villain for rebels that's not Vader because no because. The cartoonishness of the show lends yeah, to Vader the fact can't that lose the good guys have to win every episode. And that was the big complaint about Thrawn in Rebels, was that Thrawn is this master tactician, and so they had to, at the end of every episode, have a one-and-a-half-minute scene of Thrawn going, ah, uh, yes, according to plan, when he just got his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Emperor a lot, yeah. <laughs> and so that was exactly what that is, and so... We, we don't want that to happen with the Batch, and it hasn't. And so Vader coming around, I mean... It'd it's, be cool. It'd be cool. But it's it's heavy-handed. We're also only a few episodes from the finale, so yeah, yeah. anything could happen. We yeah. already got Palpatine, but it's always a stretch. You get Palpatine, but you, you don't usually get real Palpatine. It's always... Yeah. That and one is a once-in-a-lifetime yeah. opportunity getting to see... I mean, how many times have we seen evil Palpatine showing off the Force? It's like, like three Darth times, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's very Darth small. Sidious is... I mean, and this is just across TV and movies, but we see it in Revenge of the Sith. We see it in Return of the Jedi. Well, it's a little more than three because we see it in The Rise of Skywalker and we see it in um, the, the Clone Wars yeah, Clone when he Wars. goes to Mandalore. And you could argue, you can't even say in Rebels as the scene where uh, the world between worlds, he has the gateway on the ship, right. right? He doesn't do anything. He just gets angry. But we can say actually the the additional one will be in the world between worlds when he is the one with Ahsoka, and he shoots the lightning through yeah. the portal. Is that yeah. the one you're referring to? I, I don't remember. You're, I think you're referring time. to the rebuilt temple, which is rebuilt not. Temple, that's yeah. one. He's just a hologram in that. Yep, you're yep, absolutely yep. right about that. So what? We get Darth Sidious five times in all of Star Wars, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we get Vader a lot lately, especially in the Disney era, because that's the way that they lend credibility to some of the to some of the early projects. I mean, Rogue One had. The Vader scene probably made a lot of people give it an extra star out of ten. Man, I don't even want to go down this path because, like, you know, you saying that this is the final season really kind of cements. You, you ask these questions, what's going to happen to the Batch? Well, Darth Vader is one of those answers. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. not a fun answer. I mean, again, we've been we've been saying since the beginning, it's it's the only person who has a secure fate's Omega, and Omega only has a secure fate because she's a child. 
Right. Like that's <laughs> the that's the only reason that our fa- for the rest of the guys, it's they could totally lose it. And at least one member I think is gonna have to kick the bucket. Crosshair is probably gonna make some epic sacrifice. Unfortunately. Um but we have a lot more dialogue that um Ventress lays down right here that has some has some worthy to digest moments on it. And so she then says, after a few more lines, she goes, those with a high M count are thought to be, she's explaining to the Batch and to Omega specifically what an M count is. And so she says, those with a high M count are thought to be more capable at wielding the Force. Um, and so we all know why they put that line of dialogue in there, right? I mean, I underlined the word more. She didn't emphasize it, but the word more specifically means anybody can be a Jedi, because she says everybody has the varying levels, and so it's for Sabine from Ahsoka. It was so, so people can definitely, firmly say, all right, this is understood Jedi teaching from even before. Yep. Um, so my these these lines were uttered, and I'm like, you need to say midichlorians. <laughs> and, of course, a few sentences later, right, and we'll get to that. But I'm like, what? why can't you just say this? Quit saying him count. Say the word. Pull it off like a band aid. Do it. You know. Right, do it. <laughs> right. I mean, and that's the second time we've heard midichlorians on screen. I think, right? In all the Star Wars uh, that I can recall, I think Kanan maybe says it. That's a that's a maybe though, because M count wasn't invented by the time of Rebels. We get M count for the first time in the Mandalorian. Okay. And so perhaps Kanan says it, but I know that the reason it, it, Disney it created M count yeah. is because they were shying away from using midichlorians and i'm not saying that's the wrong decision it's honestly probably the right decision but i want to hear it you say say their name yeah, yeah say exactly. their name <laughs> <laughs> which she does in the next couple sentences right uh, so, uh omega's frustrated that uh asajj is being kind of cagey about this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so we then have a very common misconception come out of omega's mouth that's important for people, especially more casual fans, to see the distinction here. And that is, Omega says, am I a Jedi? You know, does that make me a Jedi? And Asajj um, says, no, that's you have to be trained to be a Jedi. And this is just always something people have to remember. Even just a year after the Clone War, when there were 10,000 Jedi Knights, it was still ultra rare for anybody in the galaxy to come in contact with them that most people in the galaxy didn't really even know anything about them. They were mythical wizards that have powers and so omega does not understand the distinction between wielding the force and being a jedi yeah the 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 best analogy i like to use is if a gandalf literally walked through your front door you know that's how obviously wizards aren't real i'm not making any illusions that they are (laughs) but they're mythical to us right Mm -hmm. if they showed up we would be flipped out if he was sitting there making shooting fancy fireworks and doing wizard stuff. And so it'd be the same thing to the common person, I think, in Star Wars. Right, right. Uh, it is, you know they're out there, you know they're doing stuff, but no one ever has ever seen one. You've only ever heard of it. Mm-hmm. And, and so it might as well not exist. Right, right. Like if you met a real spy and they just like spilled everything about them being a spy to you, that would be like meeting a Jedi. Like we know spies are real, but as far as you know, you've never met one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... This is this this average people in the Jedi understanding that is an important thing just for context of this, um, just for the context of the show. So we then have Ventress say she's going to test Omega's M count. She obviously doesn't have one of those machines that Qui Gon does where he just pricks Anakin. So she's got to do it a more down to earth way. She's got to do it a more bare bones prehistoric Jedi way. Um, and so she puts she puts Omega through her own little Dagobah, her own little Octo. <laughs> I mean, this is if if we are to if we are to think that Omega's character persists and becomes a Jedi or becomes some breed of Force user, this is her Dagobah and her Octo. I mean, it this is. is maybe this is maybe her aboard the Millennium Falcon um, from Episode Four, but it's still her first steps into the wider universe, like Obi Wan says. It really is. Um, and so we get to see this. It mirrors all the same things. You have her standing one leg, Ventress standing right behind her, looks just like Luke behind Rey on Octo. You have her balancing the fruit on her head, just like Yoda had Luke balance things. I mean, there's a lot of rhymes throughout these scenes here. It really is, and and um, Omega is not having it. She's not, she's like, she's making a lot of excuses. Mm -hmm. The rock's Mm -hmm. too slippery. I don't understand why we're doing this. And, you know, one contrast that we didn't get, basically the only line was, uh, from Asajj is 
those with an M count are thought to be more capable of wielding the force. And then she says something about midi chlorians. You know, we got from Luke towards Ray, and we got from especially from Yoda towards Luke. And a lot when they're teaching younglings and all this stuff, it every time I think about it is is Yoda explaining what the force is. You know, mm-hmm. and and I don't think Omega got a good explanation of what the force is. No, certainly not. She didn't. Asajj didn't tr- yeah. offer anything up. She's just like, all right, stand here, do this, and uh, reach out, concentrate. All right, pass or fail. You know, you're just on your own. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's not a complaint, really, in a sense of it, it, it's just like there's more going on here and we'll get to that. I'll say, you know, you just you just really opened up something pretty interesting right there with Yoda gives this delivery of what the force is. Ben does. Luke does. All of these Jedi in this line of Jedi can really readily explain what the force is, because that's the most important part of being a Jedi, right, is understanding the force in the in a way understanding how it works to the degree that the jedi do they it's not a perfectly unlocked thing to them it's still a mystery but even having a step towards that mystery is always the first step for these and so asajj doesn't give omega anything like that like you said and ventress's character is really interesting because she may of any care maybe any character in star wars have the most varied experience with the Force, um, but she still isn't putting it into words in any way. She has formal Jedi training, just a little bit of it, when she was a Padawan. She has Sith training, obviously. She is a Knight Sister. She continues to wield the Force as a bounty hunter. And so she's explored the light side. She's explored the dark side in multiple ways. And so she's gone through this journey through the Force more than most characters have. Um, but she still doesn't have some kind of ready definition because of how torrid her life has been. Yeah. All the people who rant about and talk about gray Jedi, they, they got their, yeah, they she, got that exclamation that. point above their head <laughs> when they saw this big time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Cause you know, she is by all counts and there's evidence at the end of this episode, a light side user now, um, I mean, she still uses the dark side also, but yeah, she's... She's not going to go force choke somebody. She is... Well, she did in this episode. Oh, well, I thought she was just lifting him up. <laughs> uh, I think I, she was choking him, but maybe not. I mean, it was very brief. Little debate. Could um, be, yeah. <laughs> she, uh, but regardless, she is clearly more in tune in the light side, and there is some evidence here than she was, obviously, when she was a Sith, or even in the latter episodes of The Clone Wars. Um, is it fair... Uh, this is This is just a question for you. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. Um, but I will try to convince you of my opinion after you answer. <laughs> is um, do you think Asajj is Omega's first master? Oh gosh, I struggled with this a lot after I watched this episode. Um, and you have to take the whole rest of the episode into context. And if we're looking just in the lens of this episode, you have to say no. It's too dangerous, and she doesn't want that heat right now. Um, and I think that's what she communicates to the batch at some point in this episode. Um, but looking down in the pat, looking in the future, um, it could be interesting. Okay. Right. I mean, uh, it's not my first pick obviously, uh, because, but, but as far as like, like you just alluded, she's, she, you can make an argument that she's one of the most well-rounded Jedi who can survive death somehow. (laughs) Right. Right. And, uh, um, so she could be an excellent master. I mean, you know, I, Teachers and masters and, and uh, you know, that apprentice relationship, I'm not a good teacher, so it's hard for me to speak on stuff like that. Um, but, it, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking of this strikes me as like a Karate Kid moment where where the Karate Kid is famous for uh, uh, Daniel wants to learn karate to, to fight the bullies. And the guy's like, all right, wash my car, wax my deck here, wax on, wax off. And he's not he's been teaching him karate the whole time. Well, this whole episode is okay. Stand here and do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No explanation. No, she is real Mr. Me. That's a great point. Yeah. And then, okay, run up to this tree, do this. Okay. Here's this other test. You have to reach out Mm -hmm. and, and Oh, at the end she reaches out and in a major way and in, in a not intended way. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, you talk about rhyming. This is almost a, it's not exactly an analog. It's kind of kind of has a different tone to it, 
but it's almost a Mr. Miyagi thing. Yeah, no, I think that's a very well had point. Um, and we'll get into some of the reasons that um, when Omega does these tests, the way she behaves and the way she succeeds and fails at some of them. Um, and I think that's a very important first point there. Um, and your your point about the consent between a Jedi Master and a Padawan is something that I think is important because my take on it is is that Asajj is Omega's first master. They only trained for two days with each other, um, and there was no formal acknowledgement of that. And so maybe that formal acknowledgement matters. But in the wider scheme of the Star Wars universe, when you look at the way that the Force works... The Force works in mysterious ways, moves in mysterious ways, and it's it's the Force has brought Asajj and Omega together for this reason. This is the Force knew or or needed Omega to have this knowledge at this moment, and so one, they've been united in the Force that way, and two, I don't know if a length of time of training is any kind of criteria because how long did Ben have with Luke? I mean, what, a couple days? Max, yeah, yeah. max. Yeah. Um, and, and and that was definitely a master-apprentice relationship. Yeah, it was. And that's where, you know, they consent. They were like, yes, this is a master-apprentice relationship. Luke readily said that. Um, and Ben did as well. And uh, Saj and Omega Hammett. So if that, you know, straight-up consent between the relationship right there matters, then probably not. Omega and Asajj are not. But I, I like to think that the Force putting them together... And putting Omega through these tests and having Asajj specifically put Omega through these tests makes, whether or not they have any more contact between the two of them, I think it still makes Asajj Omega's first master. Yeah, I mean, and there's, I agree with you 100% with that. And there's so much more at play here. You know, this is one of the most, this is the refrain from most of the Star Wars we have. You know, Kanan comes across Ezra and he's the same age roughly as mm -hmm. Omega here. And then you, uh, 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 Qui-Gon finds Anakin and he's way younger. And the refrain always is he's too young. He's or, too old. He, I'm too sorry, old, yeah, too, too old. old to begin the training. Yeah. Too old to begin the training, all this other stuff. And so, um, like, gosh, there's so much to this when you get right down to it. My my, it's hard for me to align on my thoughts. So like, we saw what Anakin was capable of. We've seen what Ezra is capable of. And when you talk about too old to begin the training, uh, Sabine, we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so... Sabine's like the oldest apprentice in history, it looks like. Yeah. And, and, I mean, and in each one of these, all of these folks come with so much baggage mm -hmm. that you can see why, obviously, the the Jedi Order snatched these kids up when they were little babies, right? Because they're they're way more impressionable and you can basically, I mean, it, it literally is brainwashing the Jedi code into these young sure, ones, right? It is. And so but it's necessary for the attachments. Part. Oh yeah, yeah. For, yeah. For, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's more about the the being a like we've already discussed. It's more about uh, the Jedi code than it is being a Force wielder mm -hmm. when you're when you're a Jedi. And so uh, contrast that with what most of Star Wars is. And what did what did a uh, Balin Skull call uh, Ezra and Sabine? Wildlings, Boken Jedi, Boken Jedi. So here we have just another Boken Jedi, potential right, Boken right. Jedi, which um, um, Asajj is is an even. I, I want to say worse version of that. That's not true because, like you said, she started the academy, uh, lost her way, and there's been way more other uh, Jedi younglings lose their way and leave the academy. Uh, it's the Obi Wan comic. Uh, that we see then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so there's the reality is you can easily make the argument that as many literal Jedi's there are there's just as many Boken Jedi out there. Yeah, like there's ten thousand Boken well, Jedi. Well, not not Boken Jedi is too strong. You know, it's a spectrum. There's going to be people who, like we speculated before this, of they're they're just like they have this attunement with animals or they have this empathic ability that we speculate Omega has. Like she's just untrained and that's her untrained ability or the little kid who, Oh, well I think there's, yeah. there's many, many more than 10,000 untrained force yeah. users out well, there. Well, but, but you can, even then this is, you're breaking down into this tree in the spectrum of like, like we see in some of the books, uh, uh, this is way later that I think it was some of the Sith books, uh, 
this guy knew he was force sensitive and the Jedi were a myth and all he could do was read books. He never had a master. And so he was able to figure, he was able to bumble into a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot, so much of this, as we see with Sabine, it all comes down to your willpower and capability, Mm -hmm. which. And your belief. I mean, with with Sabine, it came down to just her, her faith. Yeah. Faith. Exactly. Right. And with Omega here, she's like, She's not believing this at all. No, she's not. But yeah. she has no foundation, as we yeah. talked about. She yeah. has she's no foundation. Too old. Yeah, yeah, she's too old. But that's so, you know, aside from the attachments, everybody else had a lot more baggage. Aside Way from more. attachments, they had problems. Um, and before this episode, I would have said, but Omega doesn't. You know, she's this pure of heart, you know, just wants to do right. The only baggage she brings is attachments, what everybody else has brought. But they they really do a great job in this episode of kind of showing you more flaws in Omega's character than just the, she has attachments. Um, and so we, we, we get into that a little bit later. Um, so Omega's doing the first test. Crosshair has done some research, and he goes off and finds in Tech's old files who Asajj is. They learn who Asajj Ventress is. And so they're immediately alarm bells up, super happy they were able to identify Asajj. Because that's just like, they definitely should have been able to do that. You know, I think we've mentioned these before, but in Iraq they had those playing cards that had all the most wanted on them. (laughs) They definitely need to sell a Star Wars pack of those with Asajj, Dooku on them, all of them. And so she was on those playing cards they were passing out to the clone troopers. Yes, they were. So she was, yeah, they needed to have recognized her. If they hadn't, that would have been a big plot hole. But I was happy that they immediately did, and it caused really good conflict. Um, So Asajj sends Omega up to the top of the mountain to go retrieve this white blossom before sunset. And the sun is already setting. When she says that, like as the audience, I think we are expected to look over Omega's shoulder and we can see the sun. And I was so confused. I was like, it's not morning. Like, they're not giving her all day. I was like, it's night. That sun's going down. Yeah, in real life, you got... (laughs) Mere moments before the sun yeah, goes Yeah, the sun is very, very comfortably on the horizon yep. at this point. It's already obstructed partially. I think that already is considered sunset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so she sends um, Omega off, and Omega's doing this task um, to continue her M count test. And then the Bad Batch square off with Asajj. And so it's just the scenes move between these. And so... Omega, we first see her head up the mountain. She finds Batcher, and you know her kinship with Batcher is very clearly part of the Force. Now we yes, know it is. we know how how much kinship they have, but also they've developed a kinship that you would normally just with an animal in general, like a human being could develop a kinship with an animal. So this is dramatically amplified from some Jedi trying to call a wild animal to come help them. That's I right. mean, if a Jedi has a trained pet, that it it basically seems to me that that pet is an extension of them at that point, point. Um, and so. She's able to succeed at this task through her MCAT by being able to use Batcher in her relationship. Just being adept at realizing, hey, Batcher's here. I can ride on his back. Right. And and, and knowledge of how to navigate the island for sure. Yes, yes. Um, So we then have Ventress and the Bad Batch stand off. You know, they're like, you're a war criminal. You've killed hundreds of clones. They're not wrong. <laughs> um, they are totally justified in being terrified of Ventress. I think they're not being near strong enough. They're not. They're telling her to leave, and they should just try to kill her. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's she just. Should be, she should be murked by these guys. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> they don't know Ventress though, and that's the problem. <laughs> is they do then that escalates and they pull their blasters. Ventress pulls them out of their hand and they're immediately stunned. They're like, oh no. And so then <laughs> they, they get in this fight and Ventress just beats the tar yeah, out of she these bodies guys. these guys. Oh, big time. It's super cool. It's a really it's well a choreographed fight. fight. Yep. I mean, the knife throw, the way she's mo- using Wrecker's body and using the momentum of the guys. It was a really cool fight. She, did, she yep. does a really cool job. And it's just, it's to be expected. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's three versus one if you're a force user these guys right. are some of the most elite clones in the republic army and that doesn't matter ventures yeah. is tr- a trained force user yeah well and and hyper elite too i mean she was that undercover operative and yeah she was ultra well, I mean, stealth and all this other stuff as right? far as she believed she was one of the two sith i mean she was gonna be the next one right behind but she was a sith dooku didn't consider her one but she considered herself one right she was exceptionally powerful yep um and so this was, it was, like we said, great choreographed fight, really good result. The guys are, the guys are beaten, but Crosshair is able to sneak off and basically make it a draw 
because he draws his blaster and then he tosses them to the guys. So then they all have blasters back. And you think, why doesn't she just rip them out of their hands again? I think just assuming that now they know that trick, they can hold on to them tighter or something, right? <laughs> like, they're just... I don't I don't know why you would be holding a gun loose enough to let someone rip it out of your hands with no. the force, but now I guess they're holding them tight enough. Trained yep. soldiers are now now got their guns gripped. Yep. Shock um, and awe factor. Yeah, exactly. And so they, they start opening fire on Ventress. We get some cool acrobatics, um, almost like she is hesitant to whip the lightsaber out. Um, but then she does because it's, I mean, three people shooting at her, um, and she, we get to see that awesome yellow lightsaber. Um, aside from the Jedi survivor game, I think that this is the first time we get to see one of these in action. Obviously we see it at the end of the rise of Skywalker. Ray has a yellow lightsaber, but I think that as far as TV and movies go, this is the first time we get to see a yellow lightsaber in action. I have a vague memory of Jedi guards, but. Yeah, yeah, there. actually, that's true. But I think, oh, no, we get to see the Jedi, the vision that Kanan has in the Lothal Jedi Temple where he duels the Jedi Temple guards. I okay. think that there are yellow in that scene. Um, so, may, so yeah, this isn't the first time. It's one of the first times, um, and it's super cool. Every time you get a yellow lightsaber on screen, it's worth mentioning. Yes, it is. Because before, before, 1990, before 1998, no one would have believed it would happen. And <laughs> after 1998, still barely anybody believed it would happen. Right. Um, so we then have Omega come down the mountain. She's excited. She's got the flower. And she sees what I thought was Ventress with her lightsaber, a hunter's throat on the ground, and then her choking wrecker. Yeah, you she think she be. was just holding him up, which yeah. we don't know. I'm not saying either one and of And only based right. on this is he wasn't making choking sounds that I heard could be wrong yeah but wrecker's probably got like a reinforced windpipe he's probably <laughs> got like i mean wrecker's throat's probably harder to crush than yeah, most and, people's and, throats and what really struck me and, and another buttress of that of my opinion is if she wanted these guys dead it'd be nothing oh 100 yeah, they're dust in the 100%. wind right i think the choke would be more of a threatening thing than yeah. anything she wasn't trying to kill him and then like if you're dealing with this if you're wanting omega to be on your side you're not going to go kill the people closest to her. Tr yeah, true. Unless but she is holding a lightsaber to Hunter's throat. I mean, <laughs> using the choke well, as she has a, to defend herself. Yes, I agree. I agree there. But I'm saying that this is, you know, she's got a lightsaber at Hunter's throat. Whether she's choking Wrecker or not, I don't know if that part matters with Omega having seen the lightsaber at Hunter's throat. Yeah. Um, but I don't think she was trying to kill him regardless. I totally agree with you there. Um, Hunter then yells, she's a war criminal. Um. And that's just like, what, I mean, by what definition, man? Like, <laughs> like she is, you're right, but that, that neither of those governments exist anymore. Yeah. And you're a war criminal by most people in the galaxy's standards right now. Um, so this was a little bit of a hypocrite scream. So I'll, I'll say a small part on this, and I, I'm not a historian, I'm not an authority, um, but after the Civil War in America ended— for Ameri for anybody listening to this outside the United States, um, it, like there were participants in that war who did heinous and nasty things to people and, and other military people. And it, you couldn't hide behind the uniform. Your reputation kind of stuck with you, right? So if you did horrible and nasty things, and, and I'm not talking about any side, you know, I'm not talking about just the common stuff. Oh, we're on the other sides and then we killed each other. Right. I'm, I'm not, I'm talking about like what we would consider war crimes in the 21st like century. Like bona fide, nasty war crimes. And so, uh, uh like <laughs> from a clone's perspective, just killing clones is going to be war criminal. And I guess what it, you could attribute some terrorist bombings to Assange, right? That wouldn't be a stretch. And that would, could be easily labeled a war crime. Oh, I think Assange yeah. is a war criminal. I think by Republic definition, she's a war criminal. Right. Well, and so your argument is that because that de government doesn't exist, there's nobody to enforce that definition or penalty, right? I mean, no, the Empire would take her in under the in publicly under the auspices that they are the successor government to the Republic. She was a criminal when they were the Republic. She's still a criminal when they're the Empire because the way the Empire rises is they lauded it as a Republic victory. Republic okay. won this war. Um, we won. You know, they're like, we don't need the clones anymore because we won. Um, the droids are all shut down because we we beat the separatists. Well, and, and, and just to add to that, my only point is, is like, regardless of of your definition of war criminal or this or that, your reputation is always going to whatever you're known for 
in 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 a wartime situation is going to follow you for the rest of your existence. Oh yeah. You oh, can't yeah. you know um your side can win or you could get some sort of like an operate here's another thing uh, in in World War II in America uh, the German scientists were imported from to America for to work on our rocket program. Right. Operation Paper. Operation Paper. Very controversial, right? And and a lot of people have a lot to say about that. Um because these were very bad people in 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 a very right sense and they got they got basically almost no consequence from it, right? Yeah, so, total so, immunity. So, like, here it is from the from the batch's perspective, a bona fide war criminal walking around with no consequence, right? And and given and whoever gets into power, this person could be uh, have they just strut on down the road, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? I'll, I'll also say that using the term war criminal in Star Wars is super interesting because <laughs> their definition of war crimes cannot possibly be the same as ours because Anakin falsely surrenders multiple times. Yeah. There's like all kinds of violations of the real world Ex- Geneva Convention. Executing detainees, so yada, yada, yada. Whatever <laughs> their definition of war crimes is, is not our definition of war crimes. Yeah. But, I mean, executing detainees is probably the most ready example of it's probably against, or it's probably considered war crimes in Star Wars, and Asajj definitely did it. <laughs> um, so there you go. <laughs> yep. Um, so they, the guys are like, we shouldn't trust her. Totally true. Absolutely correct. They are telling Omega they shouldn't trust her. And these guys should not listen to a child in this situation. <laughs> like this is where Omega's right because we know Asajj has changed from these guys perspective. Totally not. Should not listen to Omega. Should get Asajj out of there. Should really just try to kill her. Like not cool to let Asajj Ventress hang around. She is an evil person by these guys. Yes. From very, everything that they know. Very evil. Um, And so, but Omega w- wins out. She, with her child logic, is able to thwart these three grown men by saying, <laughs> people can change. <laughs> yep. This woman may have murdered thousands of clones, but she's different now. Um, And so uh, they then let Omega go hang out with her by herself. <laughs> Yeah, very strange. <laughs> um, so Omega goes out the next day um, without the batch to start the final test. And so we know that the batch is like watching over. Her. They've got their a scope and their crosshair's got a scope on Ventress the whole time. They've got their binoculars on her. They they are aware of what she's doing. Um, but she she goes out to sea with Ventress for the final test. And Ventress just tells her to stand out there, hold her hand out, and try to sense things. Um, and again, to someone like Omega, this just doesn't even make any sense. I yep. mean, it's, you know, it's just, a, it, it, there's no basis for it. It's the same as telling one of us to just go out there and put your hand out and sense things. Yep. Um, it, and so she is, she is arguing with Ventress and then Ventress says, your lack of training and discipline. And Omega says, I am trained. And Ventress says, this is different than being a soldier. And so these three lines of dialogue are really important because Omega is a soldier. She's been trained as a soldier. By season three, she is a soldier. She's picked up all these traits from the guys. We've talked about it before. She's a one-woman bad batch. She's about to be. And so Omega is a kind of Jedi that I don't know if we've seen before. The whole prequels, the whole Clone Wars, the controversy is about the Jedi becoming soldiers, right? It's about the Jedi going from peacekeepers to soldiers. And so Omega is, as far as I can think about in all of the Star Wars canon, the only one who goes from soldier to Jedi. And she's not a Jedi yet, but we can assume she might be. And if this is her Dagobah and her Acto, then she's, she is. And so... We take Omega, who has now been trained as a soldier, and give her force powers, and she takes them with her soldier's morality mentality. I mean, we can even look at Luke or Ray, and they are not examples of soldiers. Luke is, I mean, he is he a has a boy. rank yeah. in the Alliance, but he never ascends to general like Han or Lando because he is not in the formal Alliance military hierarchy. He resigns right after Return of the Jedi. Ray gets in an argument with Poe in The Rise of Skywalker about how she's not out there helping the cause and she's just training she's not a soldier and so this is our first look at at a soldier turned jedi um that i think we're going to get a so, different kind and, of jedi and what would you call sabine just a warrior turned a warrior yeah, yeah. i wouldn't refer to her as a soldier um because she's not i mean she's much less i mean she's more of a mercenary turned jedi you know right, right. it's uh she's got that skill set that's she is way more 
I don't want to say think outside the box because that's not what I mean. But she's a lot less conventional. That's the right word right. than okay. a soldier would be. Yep. Um, and so yeah, I would I would still think that I would call Omega the yeah. first one that we're aware yeah, of. Yeah, I agree with you 100. percent And that's a really great concept uh, that I can't wait to see how they explore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really, mm-hmm. that's that's fascinating. Um, so Omega's failing at trying to sense anything out there. So Ventress shows her what she's talking about, and. Ventress is really showing her affinity for the Force right here. She walks out on that deck, um, and she begins to draw all of these fish, these glowing fish, up to near the surface of the water. And I think that this is important proof to the audience, especially people who never read the Dark Disciple novel, that Ventress has changed. Because communing with animals is a 100% light side of the Force trait. The people with the dark side can dominate animals. They can make animals obey their will. But this is very clearly more of a symbiosis. Yes. Um, and so this is an important example of Ventress changing her ways and now using the light side. Yep, I agree. Um, but she also inadvertently calls up this giant monster. And I was super pumped. This is a Star Wars <laughs> yeah. monster. If you listen to our previous couple episodes, I w- I've been griping about how a lot of the monsters in the Bad Batch yeah, have just alligator. been real animals. <laughs> exactly. It was an alligator last week. And so they're just regular animals that don't that already exist in our universe. Yeah, and this one was scary. Yeah, this one was scary. It was like an ammonite. I mean, it, yeah, it was like, you know, ammonites, they're those little, for anybody who doesn't know, they're they're like a prehistoric snail. Um, I don't even, I don't even, they probably exist now. I'm not a biologist. I don't know, but I know that they're prehistoric snails. And so, um, this was like a mega version of that. It looks like Omnistar, the Pokemon. Um, and so I was all over this thing. I I thought it was great. Great Star Wars monster. Best one of 2024 so far. So far. Yep. Um, and I really like how Asajj handled this. Uh, you know, the bad show up in their, in the Marauder, their little starship and they're shooting at it. She remarks to Omega, like, oh, you're making this worse. Because this thing has tentacles, too, mm-hmm, and drags mm-hmm. Omega under. Asajj cuts one off. But the, this thing is about to eat Asajj, and you talk about communing with fish. She communes with this thing and yep, calms yep, it. Yep. Very cool scene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. It was super cool, and her communing with them is just such a good character change because she's clearly communing. communing, She's clearly using the light side. And visually, this monster is so interesting. It has this, like, multi-chromatic hull, and it just is reverberating with the with Asajj, and it feels really... In, it's in tune with her breathing. When you watch this scene, her chest lifts up and down the same way those colors move through it. And so it's just like a really warming scene. I was very happy to hear that. This was a necessary thing for people. For fans of Asajj Ventress, this episode must have been very welcome. Yeah, oh my goodness, that's almost an understatement. So, the impact of this scene to me is, you know, she starts off uh, with Omega and it's like, you know, because she had seen Omega with Batcher before and she says, a lot of uh, Force users are more attuned to nature and animals than they are other aspects of the Force. And so that's why she has Omega out there is because oceans are teeming with life of all sizes from microscopic all the way to these uh, mega, mega uh, ocean life that we get to see. And so um, she she starts off, Osage starts off and to show Omega about this fish and Omega when the big one shows up. Omega says, did you intend to do that? And, and Asajj, what did she say? Not really. <laughs> right. Yeah. She yeah. said, no, yeah, not, yeah. yeah, not on purpose. But this turns into a big win for Asajj because it's one thing to pull up a few fish and show off. That's almost like a parlor trick for a Jedi. Mm-hmm. But to even accidentally call up this mega snail thing and calm it, like this has to have cement, like, you know, we start off this discussion is, is Asajj Omega's master. Well, she she take when she takes off, the seeds are planted in Omega's brain. Now, right, and, right. And, and, and planted isn't the right word. Like, uh, almost like if you got a tooth installed and that glue that never breaks, your tooth is <laughs> never coming out. This this uh, mind's eye picture of what the force is capable of through the conduit of a force user is going to. Hopefully, this is my hopeful, wishful thinking, is going to alter the way that Omega thinks about how she interacts with the whole universe. Mm -hmm. No, I hope so. I mean, and this is, as we've said, her first step into a wider universe. 
these are your first steps. And so I really hope that it gives, with Omega's already really compassionate outlook, she's going to be a good Jedi. Um, but this is the element that she needs. She She's basically like a not Force-sensitive Jedi already. And so now she needs to unlock that potential. Um, and, I, and Ventress really helped her move her in that direction. Kind of, though. I mean, not not completely, because... When Ventress leaves, as far as Omega knows, Omega doesn't have a high M count. She tells her, she says, you don't, you don't have a high M count. Yeah. You know, count yourself lucky. The Empire is not after you. And then when she leaves, the guys can immediately tell Ventress is lying, and they say that's a lie. And Ventress tells them, you know, if she has a high M count, she's going to be hunted her whole life. You three bozos aren't going to be able to teach yeah, her what she, she needs to, to know. She has to be trained otherwise. Exactly. And it's so mandatory. And so your choice is, you know, she doesn't have a high M count and just continue to avoid it or give her away. Um, it's the, it's the Grogu problem, essentially. Right, right. Um, and so. And it's compounded. She all, Asajj also warns, like, y'all, you need to leave here. Right? right. Yes. And so this is a telegraph, like we started talking about, that somebody's, because, because the, the batch asked her at the first, how did you find us? And she's like, I have my ways, being all cryptic. And even at the end, I was sitting there like, tell, I want to. I wanted to will the batch to ask her, you need to tell us how you got here, you know? <laughs> right. Um, right. But, but, uh, Asajj is like, you can't go be asking around about M count. You're going to draw the wrong attention. So next episode they're hopefully they, they they've, you know, uh, maybe gone and found Sid or, <laughs> or hopefully not really literally, but you know, I don't want Pabu to get wrecked. I do think it will. I think that's my prediction for the next episode <laughs> is Pabu will be besieged by Star Destroyers. Poor Pabu. Um, but that's what I think. I think that was Ventress's line that's going to give us our tale for the next episode is that yep. they are going to have to leave because she was right. Um, you know, I don't think I mean, Ventress is clearly not gone forever. I mean, she's it, it, she we're going to have to have her story wrapped up now that it's not. Um and did you like how they handled the dark disciple problem? Because yeah, yeah. She just, I have what she said. I have more lives. Yeah, they just like ignored that. it. They just didn't say anything. She said exactly. I've got a few lives left. Um, and what a weird line that gives us no information. <laughs> that doesn't tell us anything. Um, well, I mean, it just opens the door to too much stuff. Like night sister magic is night sister magic is is I think obviously the answer, but like. And this is this is totally out. Of, I don't believe this. It's totally out of left field. But a lot of you know when when people are like, "Oh, Tech is still alive," all the all the discussions are on the table when it gets right down to it. Sure, sure. But but you could easily sit there and say that she is some sort of in league with the Emperor and a precursor to this uh, Project Necromancer or something like that. Where she's transferring her consciousness. Like, man, that's what? beyond the pale. That's a crazy, no, that's crazy rabbit hell. But yeah. but I guarantee you. All the YouTubers are going to pop up some right. sort of nonsense right. about You're that. You're right. I that is yeah. beyond the pale nonsense. You're right. It is. But we're going to learn something about Asajj. And so they handled the Dark Disciple problem by ignoring it. Um, that's kind of annoying. Um, but Jennifer Corbett recently said in an interview that it is going to be addressed. It just wasn't going to be addressed in this. They're just grateful that they got to use her um, because, you know, someone else had planned to bring her back. And so... We will get that explanation eventually. I'm sure we will because this is kind of the kind of thing that demands an explanation. Um, she's firmly dead at the end of Dark Disciple. She's firmly alive right here. But I honestly, no matter how much so, I wanted it explained, remind me at what point in time Dark Disciple. I haven't. I don't. Dark remember. Disciple happens like a month before Revenge of the Sith. Okay. It's just it's it's right before it. Maybe just a couple Somewhere months, she, but it's and, right before. And I'm sorry for spoilers for anybody listening. Wants to, I, she hacked to pieces or something? Or No, Obi-Wan and, Qui and Quinlan, um, she's electrocuted to death by Dooku. And Obi-Wan and Quinlan set her body adrift in a Dathomir lake. Okay. Um, so and yeah, so, Night Sister Magic is the path of least yeah, resistance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's, I mean, they set her down. They, her body sinks down, and it's just, yeah. something's, something's going to happen there. Um, but it didn't, you know... I, as much as I wanted it explained in this episode and as much as I wanted all the dots to connect, it's smart of them to not because people who are mere, or not reading the novels, which is a vast swath of Star Wars fans, um, they're not going to know anything about her death. They did, they, she died in a book, and she, now she's back. And so not explaining it in the show makes it a lot easier on those fans because her story didn't wrap up in the Clone Wars, and now she's back. And they're like, oh, her story is continued. The Dark Disciple blip was originally planned for the Clone Wars show, and after Disney canceled it, they didn't make it. Um, that's a real bummer, because it's an awesome story. 
Um, but I'm sh- I'm sure it's still canon, and it's they're they're not decanonizing that story. Yeah, they're just adding more to it. Exactly. Um, and so I would encourage anybody to go read that book, and we will eventually see the whole path of Ventress's life. But we don't have that now. So after have especially after our discussion, I, I so love getting your insights, and I I hope our dear listeners can can draw from that too. Um, I really want to see more about Asajj. You put it into the best context, talking about how just just her life story, where she started, uh, where she's been, this surviving death type thing. And, and like I remarked about the whole Grey Jedi aspect, I mean, what is she going to be capable of out here doing in this empire menacing mm-hmm. galaxy? Mm-hmm. It, the potential is off the charts cool. Right, right. And it's it's interesting that she's still, I mean, you got to make a, la- a life for yourself. So she's still bounty hunting, obviously. But it is interesting that she's not laying that low, it doesn't seem. I mean, she's laying as low as possible. But it's she's still got an MCAT. She's still force sensitive. She's using the force in front of strangers. Now, she probably thinks that the batch is okay, but she's still doing it. Well, yeah, and she showed up in complete stealth on this. Yes, that was cool. Thing. That was awesome. Just and, running across Ventress like that was neat. Yeah. Not and, the, not the anticlimactic jump scare part but the fact that she was hiding was cool yeah and and so she has capabilities beyond what we've seen otherwise i mean because the obi-wan show starts out and reva's like hey, we can find you jedi so easily y'all start doing all I'm, I'm badly paraphrasing it but she's y'all start doing all these good deeds and you just pop up and so like the path of least resistance on that of how of like well how do they figure it out literally is anybody who ignites a lightsaber is basically like this beacon of snitches right. out to these and granted you know that the inquisitors aren't yet but in this in the Obi Wan they're like hey you see somebody using a lightsaber you're getting a thousand credits just off the rip mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. deposit it next day we're going to show up investigate it you might get more something like that right so. What is Asajj doing out here that she's I can obviously stay under the radar quite well. Right. But she's not and she and she can body anybody she wants almost. So she's very capable in not only doing what she's doing for a living, but not re- tipping her hand about right. being a force right. user. And that's the that's the thing, is we see her try so hard to not whip the lightsaber out. Um but she's still using you know, she's using acrobatics that can be uh, explained away. Because we've seen other people in the Star Wars galaxy that are not force sensitive use acrobatics like that, and so the the problem of her using her lightsaber if she's if she's in the underworld and she's still bounty hunting it she's gonna have to use it at some points like it's her last line of defense and as a bounty hunter you're put on your last line of defense sometimes it's gonna happen and so it's the same thing we see after Mos Eisley's cantina you know Obi Wan ignites his lightsaber he's in public cuts Ponda Baba's arm off. Um, and then he, they leave the cantina. Well, that lightsaber is going to get around fast. <laughs> and not only do they immediately catch up to Obi-Wan as the Millennium Falcon, you know, busts out of Tatooine, but it's everywhere. I mean, the Empire, despite the Outer Rim being a little less maintained, it's the Empire still got people everywhere. They still are able to know when people are using lightsabers. Obi-Wan had mere hours, and that's that's giving him, that's being generous. Right. And so right. for Asajj, every time she brings the lightsaber out, it's super dangerous. And we know she's going to have to survive this way. She's either going to die, or she's going to have to survive this way for another 19, 20 years. Right. And so that was that was an interesting, that was an interesting way to end it. Um, and the show ends with her flying off um, in a super badass ship. It yeah, looks like a cool. fixed B-wing. It looks great. It looks super cool. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, I was a big fan of that. Big fan of that ship. And then it really, it just closes. It was a little abrupt. I thought we were at least going to get like a line of dialogue between the Bad Batch, just like acknowledging the adventure or something yeah, at the it's end. Like, but so it's you're just, a Jedi now? <laughs> boom. It was just done immediately. Um, so after this discussion, I liked the episode better. I don't think I have changed my mind that the it didn't move the yeah, plot line the forward. Plot line. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. But getting into the nitty gritty about all this force user stuff, midi chlorians, it gets pretty deep. Well, that's my favorite part of Star Wars. So I'm, you know, I'm happy that we got to have these conversations here, and I'm really excited to see the rest of Ventress's character. And I know, dear listener, you are interested as much as this as we are. Please leave a comment on Discord. Absolutely, yeah. I, come talk to us about this it. one. This is. You know, uh, as to me, this is a bigger turn point for Star Wars as a whole. Getting midichlorians in there, um, I'm not really having 
delve deep into that whole gray Jedi concept. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to know more, but I want to hear from you if you want to know more. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so this is probably one of the greatest candidates for that. Now, come preach to me about your gray Jedi knowledge. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm I, not a believer, but there are believers out there. Well, come proselytize yeah, perspective, in the discord. Yeah. Let's hear it. But, um, but any other aspect of this, the apprentice master relationship. Yeah. Um, I would really, I, we would, we would really welcome opinions on if yeah. this was an apprentice master relationship or not. I, and I want to hear more about, um, the, the wider implications of knowledge of M count as a whole in the galaxy. I, there might be something more like, I mean, cause these, these guys, the batch, they're not just commoners. Most, you know, the, the the Pabu people are, but like you find out that your buddy that you've been palling around with is there's something more to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And here's this other person that says, look, this is a, it's a turn point for these characters. You're either going to be on the run, even worse than what you already are, or I got to take her away. And this is a whole Grogu going away with Luke kind of problem again. Well, and you know, who's there's fault. a lot to that. You know whose fault it is that the Bad Batch isn't already caught, and it's only Dr. Hemlock's fault. <laughs> if he had told Palpatine about Omega, yeah. the Batch would be dead. Hemlock would also be dead, but the Empire would have whatever they wanted because there is there is no line of defense for the Bad Batch at this point against an Inquisitor, as you as we talked about at the beginning. What, if they send two Inquisitors after them, it's there's no chance. Zero shot. Right, right. Um, and so this this was a... I do think we'll be getting an Inquisitor soon. And it'll be yep. very interesting to see the way they escape from yep. this. Yep. Um, but that wraps up the meat of today's episode. That's all we have to say on the Bad Batch episode that I didn't say the title of on accident. And it was The Harbinger. The episode oh, yeah. was called The Harbinger. Yeah, which that um, is in reference to Asajj. Yeah, yes. And very scary because we've only got a few episodes left. We got six episodes left. Five. Six. We got six episodes left, and she is the harbinger of nothing good, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um so we now move on to our Patreon powered segment, How the Force Works. That's not how the force works. Alright, this is our Patreon powered segment. As I said, this is for Patreon subscribers of the Jedi Knight tier or above. They go to the Patreon.com and they ask us a question. We answer it here live on the show. Any kind of Lucasfilm question, Star Wars, anything you want to ask us, you can head on over to Patreon.com slash Star Wars Station and you can find the tier that's right for you. Um, but anything above the Jedi Knight tier is how you get featured right here. Colin, today's question comes from our longtime Patreon subscriber, Tristan, and he asks... Who is your favorite member of each trio? So, the, gosh, I don't even want to say for one of them because I can't pick. Um, I, so I'm going to skip the first one. The first one in my mind is Han, Leia, and You're going to skip the original trilogy. Yeah, right. yeah I'll, I'll circle back, right? Um, the second one is out of Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, that That's a fun question. Is what you consider your trio? I mean, because it could be like R two D two C three PO and Dio when it comes to the <laughs> comes to the sequels, right? Sure, sure. Um, but that's silly. Uh, so it, the second one is Anakin, and and I say that and because uh, I feel some sort of a kinship towards him in a sense of uh, being trapped in a situation where you have. Or, or it's probably wrong, but you have this um, extreme capability and potential, but in in the where you're trapped at, they won't let you uh, exercise your capabilities, right? And so, uh, um, I, I guess that's really just the angst of a young person, right? I feel like I'm smarter, and here I'm at, here I am having to clean toilets or or help customers in a retail environment, you know, really I've been to school and I've done all this other stuff, but, and what I've learned on the other end of that is you have to pay your dues. <laughs> you can't just jump to the end and fight the boss. Right. Um, so that's, so that's Anakin, uh, for the, for the sequels, gosh. So what is it? Finn, um, Poe and Ray, uh, I want to go with Poe Dameron because being a pilot like at that level of capability is really cool. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then so circling back, this is where I have a really hard time picking, right? Because so Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Leia. I can't even count the number of times that I've pretended to be Luke Skywalker with the lightsaber right. Right, growing up. Um, Han Solo has this unmatched charisma because of Harrison Ford. And a lot of that so much stems from Indiana Jones and boils over into this. Uh, regardless of the chronologically how this came out, in my mind, it all happened as I put the VHS tapes in. Right, right. right. So it's all melded together for me. Um, and then uh, I have an, a, a very high fondness for um, really well-written and capable female characters, you know, that aren't this typical damsel in distress, but are these, you know, um, female characters who have earned their spot in their own right and are just really kick ass. And, and then, I mean, like Carrie Fisher to boot, I mean, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it, it's just beyond the pale cool of what she was capable of and princess Leia and Carrie Fisher. Right. So, um, I, you're, if you're going to hold a gun to my head and have me pick, it's, it's going to be Harrison Ford. Yeah. Right. Cause just Han how, Solo. Her, yeah, Han Solo. <laughs> I Han understand. Solo, right? They're the same person. Yeah. They're the same person. They're the same person. Right. Got a, got a cool blaster and he is, uh, running away from Jabba the Hutt, helping out needy farm boys and mm -hmm. old dudes and mm -hmm. saving the princess. Ah, gosh. It, does, it almost doesn't get much cooler than that. Man. No, it I mean, really he, he drip swag. No one, <laughs> when you watch A New Hope, no one watches A New Hope and says, Luke Skywalker is the coolest character in that movie. Because yeah, yeah. you can't say that when he's standing next to Harrison Ford. Yep. Um, so for my trio, I'll do it, and I'll just answer in the same order you did, I guess. Um, so I'll do prequels first. Um, I have to say Obi-Wan. And Obi-Wan spills over a lot from his time in the original trilogy. Um... I think that dude's story is more tragic than Anakin's. I just, I just really do. I mean, he spent his whole life in the Jedi Order. Basically, nothing that happened was his fault. And he lost his friend. He lost the love of his life. He lost his order. He had to train Luke. He thought he needed to train Luke to kill him. Like, it was just over and over tragedy for this guy. And the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, for all its faults, did give us the Obi-Wan with PTSD, the everything's my fault guy. And I thought that the whole journey for Obi-Wan's character from The Phantom Menace to Return of the Jedi is perfect. Yeah, and so, Obi-Wan for me. Yep. Um, for the sequel trilogy, it's really not a contest. Rey's my favorite character in the sequel trilogy. Um, she is... A, I mean, look. Kylo is my favorite character in the sequel trilogy, but uh, out of the trio and second favorite character is Rey. Um, I like her story and journey a lot, and the the elements that she shares with Kylo in that story give that so much weight. Um, the same way that Luke's story wouldn't be Luke's story without Vader. Um, and that Luke Skywalker isn't near as compelling enough of a character without Vader. And the same with Rey, in that I really like her character and her journey, um, but she needs Kylo to stand to stand right there. And I think that that story told right there is great. Yeah, the dynamic is really cool. And then my favorite character of all time in any fiction is Luke Skywalker. So I just, I have to say Luke. I mean, it's just, it's unparalleled. The hope that Luke represents is the, the one of the greatest characters in all fiction. Yep. Very good point. So those are, that's my trio. That's your trio. I'm happy we didn't know, we didn't overlap at all, which is cool. Yep. Very cool. Um, I thought we would, I kind of thought we'd overlap on the prequels. I thought you were for sure going to say Obi-Wan. And then I knew on original trilogy, it was a complete crapshoot. If we, <laughs> if we overlapped <laughs> that's or not. That's too hard to pick, I, Well, man. yeah, exactly. Like I mean, any given day, you could have yeah. a different answer. <laughs> I, I mean, you can have a lot, like, if you're, Finn was, we can have a big discussion about if that Finn character was given the due he deserved. I think Finn would probably be my favorite character if he was given the due right? he deserved. Right? I mean, I, seriously, I get chills thinking about the possibility of what uh, that character could have been. I'm sure John of. Boyega does too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, but like that original trilogy trio is the dream team. Yeah, and absolutely. It didn't get replicated in the other ones. Right, right. I had, you know, I had uh, my favorite Star Wars characters melded, morphed over time. It was originally Boba Fett, and then it was <laughs> it was Han for a really long time. But through reading so many books that Han was featured in, like if you look at my Legend stuff, it's a lot of Han Solo. Um, I got to know Lando really well, and so then I switched to Lando, and yeah, I was like, Lando's, Lando's cooler than Han. Lando is cool because Han is cool, but Han is also like. 
lives in a van, <laughs> like down by the river. And he's, he hangs out with his dirty dog all the time. And Lando gets to do all of the cool smuggler stuff and also be this gambling, yeah, gambling rogue. Super suave. So, yeah, exactly. Drink that Colt 45. <laughs> so I'm, I moved from Han to Lando. Um, and then I settle on Luke. And Luke's been my favorite character yep. for a really long time. Yeah, good so, points. Yeah. Um, so that wraps up our How the Force Works segment, and we're going to head right now. We got some, dare I say, the biggest news ever announced <laughs> on this podcast coming up. So let's hop into the Holonet news segment. You made the Holonet. All right. I mean, we've been waiting for this news to break for probably the our entire lives. I mean, this is, as a Star Wars fan... This is the biggest thing that could possibly happen. Remember where you were yeah. when you heard that the, either if you were alive and you heard that they were going to make the prequels or when you were alive and you heard they were going to make the sequels. <laughs> Take the feeling that you had and amplify that by 10 times. And that's how much this news is going to mean to you. And so according to foodandwine.com, Star Wars is going to start selling blue milk in grocery stores across the nation, which is super exciting because where we live, we never get cool promos like this. But I looked, and it should show up in our grocery stores. That's wild. Um, so I'm pumped. I, Cassidy is going to be so tired <laughs> of blue milk in our refrigerator. I already have a plan that if I find white milk in our refrigerator, I'm going to pour it out. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make a point that as long as this exists, this is exclusively what our family is drinking. <laughs> if I could make this come out of the tap of our sink, I would. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I mean, look, it just, it, so it says it's vanilla flavored. It's not blue flavored, thankfully, like Laffy Taffy or whatever, oh but God. it is, it is <laughs> vanilla flavored. And so it's going to be good. Vanilla milk on cereal sounds good. I've never had vanilla milk. I'm not very exploratory in my milks. I've never had strawberry milk, which is kind of crazy. I've only ever had chocolate and regular. Yeah. Um. I'm the same. I, I think I've tried strawberry, and it's not for me. Oh, I've had coffee milk. They make a coffee milk. Some company down in Central Texas does, and it's good. It's um, good. I'm very scared of this. Um, it's like green French fries or something like that. Yeah, purple ketchup from <laughs> purple the 90s, ketchup, right? Not doing that. I don't, I don't like ketchup anyway. So. I am a. I also don't like ketchup. I am not a very picky eater ever, but I do have weird preferences about colors of things. Like I don't really like mini candy because I don't like but colored you're try foods. This. Star Wars, man. Of course I'm going to try it. We've got to try this. Um, this is this is mandatory as far as I'm concerned. Um, well, I hope it shows up here. I've lived a long time where watching promotional food items on TV. And it like, doesn't like, come okay, around. Okay, here's a good one. I actually tried this, so I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, in the 90s, the fried pies that you get that have um, a, like an apple or a cherry filling, they had a Ninja Turtle version. Oh, those rock. I love those pies. Yeah. And also the Ninja Turtle. That's cool, too. It had ooze filling. Ooh, the, ooh. the filling was green. <laughs> I'm not liking it anymore. I had two anymore. or three of those. <laughs> it was that wild. You want to gross. talk about weird That food. sounds disgusting. <laughs> Um, but it was it was a, it was like a vanilla thing. Yeah, sure. It was pudding sure. or whatever. Yeah, it's fine. I'm sure. But it was, it was good. very strange. Yeah. Well, I mean, breaking it open and that green filling come out. So, um, I'm wrong. There has been promotional food items. I, I guess I have a jaded because you'd see something on TV as a kid watching a commercial, and it's just it's just not here. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. But we're gonna get this hopefully because Trumu. I mean, I've seen Trumu in the grocery store. I think. Yeah. I think I have. I don't know. But for all we know, they make it down the street. We got a lot of dairy. We have tons of dairies here. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> they're just getting the blue cows down there. Yeah. What does do? Have we ever learned? This is something that I feel like I should know that I don't. What animal makes blue milk? We know what animal makes <laughs> green milk on Octo. It's food coloring. Um. Yeah. Thanks. Not real world animal. <laughs> Star Wars animal. <laughs> What's the one on Octo? I guess no. The Octo, the o one on Octo makes green milk. Was it green? It's green. I yeah. thought that was a joke. Is blue? I, I think no, you're it's a different one. No, look, there's. I've got this. Uh, the Last Jedi cross section, and I think that there's something about it in there. We'll go. We'll go to that after this podcast. Okay. But it is. It is. There's. I think a different animal. How would they get those sea? Octo was an undiscovered planet. How would they get those sea creature milks on Tatooine? They had a newsreel and. Imported those animals and bred them, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. So now that we've told you this news, 
every every other news will pair in comparison. <laughs> but we have a couple other news stories to talk about. Our first one, this one's, we've got kind of some novelty news stories today. I guess it was a slow week because um, two of these are just a little goofy, but they're funny. That one was one goofy one. And then here, this one, the last Command book, the final book in the Thrawn trilogy, is getting uh, an action figure line. Um, just a few black series, it's getting a four pack. Um, so it's going to come with Luke and Mara Jade and Jor Sabaoth, and they all look awesome. And then it comes with Luke also, which is just crazy. <laughs> which one is he? I didn't notice He's that. the one with the blue cloak on. Because okay. Luke's still wearing his Return of the Jedi robes. Oh, nice. I get um, it. And then he's wearing his, uh, like, a real Jedi a robe yeah. fatigue plus a blue cloak. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. George Sabbath also shredded. This this action figure's got an eight-pack, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't picture George Sabbath like that at all. All that was not what I thought he looked like. Um, but <laughs> hey, the, that's the cover of the book they're trying to show, right? That's true. You're right. The cover of the book does have him shredded, but just I don't know. I mean, he's he's like a decrepit old man. He's crazy. He's <laughs> nuts. Um, the pack looks super cool though. It's got it's got like this built in way to display it. They're all in fours. They look really cool. I would I would display this if I if I got one. I'd have to I'd have to. I'd have to display it. There's no way I'd take them out of the package. You got to buy two of them, right? You're that, right. That's what the answer is. Yeah, I got to I got to scoop two of those up. Um, but I think it's cool. I'm not an action figure collector, but they sometimes they get me with these packs. They're like they release something really neat. And I'm like, man, I'd like that. I'm waiting for my kids to ask me for some of these, and I'd have to buy them at that point. I get You'd to play with to, them yeah. too. Yeah, I feel like this is. I mean, I, I don't know how popular the last Command action figures are going to be. I don't know how many stores are going to buy them, but this does kind of feel like the kind of thing. If I wait a year, I might find it at Ollie's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no one bought the Trapper Wolf helmet, and it went to Ollie's. I love my Trapper Wolf helmet, but I got it for thirty bucks, and not they've made an incredible 200. amount of those. It seems like this is almost a limited edition thing. It probably is. Yeah, like, this is. You're not going to find this on shelves at Walmart, probably yeah. ever. Owning a Luke action figure, that's just that's off the hook. Cool. It is. It's super cool. It's super cool. So our last news story for today, we're talking about Mike Blanchard, and if you don't know who that is, that is the longtime Lucasfilm VP of post production. He's been in that role for 30 years, which means his career started with the special editions all the way up until now, and he's he's leaving us, which is unfortunate. But congratulations to him on his retirement. Yeah, uh, reading that article, he started he got he got that job out of college and worked his way up. I mean, that's quite the storied career to make that level of accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It it really is. Um, and you know, really good on him for all of his contributions to Star Wars. He's been he's touched this touched the saga all kinds of ways, and he's been on all kinds of the post productions for everything since then. So, really, really good on this guy. And happen again. Congratulations to him for his retirement. And I know that we're we're gonna be sadder that he's gone. Yeah, a lot of knowledge is gonna go with him, and that's a shame. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Colin, that wraps up the Holonet News segment, and now we've only got one more segment to go, and that is our Star Wars Moment of the Week. We would be honored if you would join us. All right, Colin, what is your Star Wars Moment of the Week? So, I, I spend a bunch of time <clears throat> scrolling through YouTube, and I, I like the little shorts and this, and just watching clips of shows, and it's just something to have noise in the background when I'm painting a Warhammer model or something like that. One of the ones that popped up was uh, Cad Bane versus Boba Fett at the end of the Boba Fett, the Book of Boba Fett show. And it got me thinking about this uh, fabled gunfighter fight. And, and, and Cad Bane is, you're a killer, Boba, and all this stuff. And you, we all know what happens. Uh, um, Boba Fett kills Cad Bane. But, okay, so that's one aspect of this. The other aspect is I've been watching a bunch of uh, Taylor Sheridan stuff. Oh, and yeah. if you don't know yeah. who he is, uh, he is a very successful writer and has made the Yellowstone and its spinoff series, 1883 and 1923. And um, his it, it, what started it was another movie that's set in an area very close to where we live called uh, Hell or High Water. And it's got Jeff Bridges as the as the Texas Ranger and Chris Pine is, is the bank robber wanting to uh, to pay off the bank and all this other stuff with his ill-gotten gains and his, and his crazy brother. But the story is just so gritty and hardcore and has these uh, modern spin on an old West element, right? And then so 1883 goes all the way back to 
it, it takes place after the Civil War, and there's that is still fresh on so many people's minds. It 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 it, it influences a lot of their actions, and and these immigrants want to travel from Texas, from from Fort Worth to Oregon to get take advantage of free land that that is being to to aid in colonization, and the whole trip is extremely treacherous with bandits and uh, uh, Comanches who have no like for anyone. And the story revolves around uh, um, the, the actress is Isabel May, her as Elsa Dutton. And wow, what a cool character that is that Taylor Sheridan would created and, and, and put on the screen and just the gritty awesomeness that, that he's able to weave in this stuff. So we had talked a couple of weeks ago in our, uh, uh, how the force works segment or what director you would like. Here's oh, another yeah. one I want after watching this. And I was, so I thought about Cad Bane. I'm, I'm not, he can come up with his own characters in star Wars, but I, I feel like as grizzled and hardcore as a character Cad Bane could be, or any of these bounty hunter types. And he, what, you know, all we see really is kind of like cartoony versions. Right, right. Right. And, and if like, there's always been some discussion or lament about Star Wars wanting to see an R-rated version. You know, that's a way deeper discussion that we don't necessarily want to get into of, of like, first inclination. I don't want that to exist. I want it to be magic for everyone and yada, yada, yada. Have, you know, let's leave that for comic books or something like that. But if there ever was, and you wanted this gritty, I mean, because so much of the Star Wars universe is frontier, mm, this or that, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be hard for to give Taylor Sheridan a whole other pile of money and say, we want this grittiness in Star Wars. It would be way over the top cool. I think so. I mean, I think that you give Taylor Sheridan a Star Wars movie and he really could make you this really gritty, realistic. I think it's a great idea. I think that he would excel at a Star Wars. I think that that's a, that's a really cool pick. That's, yeah, an, that's an off the wall you. one. Um, so my Star Wars moment of the week starts with a question. Are you familiar with this genre of business that just has a TV playing movies all the time while you're there? Because I keep, I'm running into these more and more. Has a TV playing movies? What, what do you yeah. mean? All right. So like I go to the, my barbershop, always there's television on playing movies. Yeah. I go, I went to an Indian restaurant today. It was just playing a movie. There was just a television playing a movie for all of their diners to enjoy. Um, there's a record store here in town. This is where my Star Wars moment of the week comes from. There's a record store here in town that you walk in there, and this guy has a couple couches and the TV, like an old-school VHS big box TV um, and VHS tapes in there in his record store. And so you can just go in there and hang out. And so I went in there for like the second time ever looking for a CD. And he's just kicking back, watching Empire Strikes Back on his couch in the middle of the workday. And so I go in there and I sit down for like 20 minutes and I just sit there and talk to this guy and watch um, the <laughs> watch the scenes in the asteroid belt. And so that was really cool. It was just a really cool little Star Wars moment of the week for me. Um, but I'm running into these businesses more and more. And so I just feel like I'm going to have these Star Wars interactions start to ramp up a little bit. Yeah, I just cool. need to go to more places with TVs <laughs> and eventually Star Wars will be on them. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was it was cool. It was neat. Um and that wraps up our podcast for this week. We've still got six episodes of the Bad Batch left. We've still got Bad Batch well into May, and then we're going to ramp up our acolyte coverage after that. So we've got a lot coming, folks. And so we really appreciate you sticking around with us. We appreciate you listening to us. If you've made it this far, you're probably a fan of the show. So leave a five-star review. Leave us a five-star review on Apple. Leave us a five-star review on Spotify. Or if you're listening on YouTube, hit that like button. Give us a subscription. It helps us more than anything you could possibly do by sharing the algorithm and putting the podcast more and more places. Yep. There's a lot of games on the horizon, too, that we're both going to play and hopefully stream on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash station media. We have a lot more other socials out there, too, right? Primarily being Instagram. Mm -hmm. Star Wars dot station. And Twitter. SW underscore station. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, we've got a Discord. We've talked about it. It's in the link of this bio. We've got a Facebook oh, yeah. page, Star, Star Wars, Wars Station. Yeah, StarWarsStationPodcast.com. Yep. That's yep. a good one. Mm -hmm. We also got the Star Wars Station Cantina, our Facebook group. So you guys can find us all over those places. And we, like we said, we talked about a lot of stuff that's up for debate in this episode. We'd love to hear your opinions on any of the topics we talked about in this episode. Yep. So 
Go join those communities. Come talk with us. Shoot us DMs on Instagram. We love it. And definitely check out patreon.com slash Star Wars Station. I mean, we've got all kinds of tiers. We've got all kinds of podcasts over there. We have an RPG podcast starting at the $2 tier. You can get stickers and t-shirts and all kinds of stuff over there. So please head on over to patreon.com slash Star Wars Station and give it a look. Yep. Always looking forward to meeting new people, doing all the stuff, interacting with them. Absolutely. So until next week, all you got to do is one thing, and that one thing is stay wizard. <laughs>